So it's a basic fact about it's a basic fact that we haven't used at all. We haven't used this because we've used crossing symmetry to view it as a symmetrical function of all sort of all momenta, all labeled to be incoming. So that the S matrix is, def is determined by symmetrical functions of four momenta. But it really is a matrix. And, and that can be used for some, some things. And the, what I want to apply this to is to the renormalization of local operators. So in this lecture, we'll relate this matrix when viewed as a matrix to another very natural matrix which occurs in gauge theory, which is the matrix of the numerous dimensions. And that there's a connection is a relatively recent realization. So this lecture will build on the work by uh, Willem, which was published uh, just last fall. And building on previous work on, by, by Zwiebel. And this work discussed the case of n quartz 4 superangles. And it heavily used, well, it was motivated, it was triggered originally by integrability of the theory and so on. But the general relation between those two things I think it's a very deep and important idea, and it has nothing to do with n course 4, nothing to do with planarity and so on. So I will present it in general uh, yeah, and give some example in QCD at first. And then we'll, we'll make contact with this integrability work here. And the relation occurs in, it's, it's very, the, the, the map, first of all, to understand the map, we basically have to understand what we want the S matrix to act on. So the first ingredient is that there are very natural states to act on, which are polynomials. The first ingredient is that a local operator in the weakly coupled theory is in one-to-one -one correspondence with a polynomial state, or what I call more precisely, polynomial form factor. And the idea is simple. Let's look in the free theory. If we write down some local operator, anything, trace phi square, we can compute its matrix element to, let's call it yeah, general or anything. We can compute the matrix element for O to dk to a bunch of unshell particles. You can compute this matrix element, and that is the form factor for O to decay into a phase particle. OK? I will denote it like that, form factor. So it's a very simple thing. And diagrammatically, I draw this O here. So for example, at the origin, and then this particle come out to infinity. At loop level, you get diagrams, no, sorry, when you turn on interactions, you get diagrams like that. You don't get a polynomial. But the first thing you get, if you just do it in the free theory, in the free theory, this form factor will always be just a polynomial if this is a local operator, because you get derivatives. And derivatives turn into b mu, just goes into p mu. Actually, there's an I here. And a local operator, for example, in scalar field theory, if you have, if you have del mu phi, well, yeah, if you have phi, it just turns into, the form factors turn into one. If you have del mu phi, well, I del mu phi, the form factor just into, turn to P1 mu if the scalar decays to leg one. And, and so on. In gauge theory, we can do the same. But now, the form factor for f 
to decay for f now, it's very useful again to use the spin or list denotation. So f is a spin one object. This can either be a symmetrical combination of spinner indices or dotted spinner indices. And this has three components because it's symmetrical. This has three, so this, this may be four. So this will include F11, F12, and F22. It's symmetrical, so there's no F21. This, and, and you add these guys, you get the three, uh, you get the six Lorentz components of, of F mu. This is a self dual part, the anti self dual part. This notation is useful because this F alpha beta can decay to one negative elastic gluon. And the form factor is just lambda alpha, lambda beta. So again, it's a polynomial in the lambdas. And similarly, F bar, decay to a plus gluon. Yeah. So the form factor is equal. So this is an equality. So the form factor for this operator to decay into a minus elastic gluon is this polynomial. So in general, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between polynomials in lambdas and lambda tildes and local operator. And you make this correspondence by looking at uh, just at the, uh, at, at the form factor. You just, you just overlap the operator with on shell states. The one important thing about this, let's look at more complicated operator. For example, uh, we can look at uh, something like F alpha beta. Let's put a trace to look at something gauge invariant. We can look at this, for example, F beta dot gamma. Okay? Let's compute the form factor for this, just at three level again. So, and, uh, sorry, this is dot, this is F bar. So this guy decays to a minus gluon. This guy decays to a plus gluon. Let's call this guy one, two. The form factor is, we have L, lambda one alpha, lambda one beta for this guy. For this guy, we get lambda two beta dot, lambda two gamma dot. And for this derivative, the derivative act on this guy, so we get, well, lambda two, lambda two tilde, which is the momentum in that guy, that's P2. And there's beta, beta dot. However, you see that this contraction here, that's this uh, Lorentz environment contraction, which is anti-symmetric and vanished, so this gives zero. So this particular form factor is zero, which of course, we could have guessed because this is the yang nils equation of motion. So in general, this form factor map throws to zero everything which is an equation of motion. So it gives us local operators modulo equation of motion, which is good because this is what we actually care about. This is much more useful than our local operators of shell. So this map automatically projects, on, projects out the equation of motion. Uh, one can do more uh, uh, examples. So uh, as another illustration, let's classify, uh, before, just to familiarize ourselves more, let's classify possible uh, dimension five or six operators in yang mills theory, say with uh, spin zero. The total spin zero means that we're looking at form factors where all the Lorentz index are, Lorentz indices are contracted. So that's, uh, let's go through this exercise now. So let's look at operators which can decay to two particles first. So what are the form factors we can write? So let's say to, we decay to 
uh, minus minus. Let's compute some. So we have to list list all polynomials. So the dimension four guys we already know. It decays to well, yeah. each particle, each f decays to lambda one, lambda one, lambda two, lambda two, and if we get a spin zero, these get constructed to one, two square. So that's what we get at dimension four. And that comes from, that can be recognized as trace of f alpha beta, f alpha beta. But we didn't need to know that. We just list the more general polynomial. And at the lowest dimension, we need two lambdas and, and yeah. We need two lambdas for each guy because of the uh, elicity of the gluon. And the, first, and, and the first thing we get is this. It's dimension four. This object is dimension two, but remember, each state, each angel state is dimension one. So the dimension is what looks like the naive dimension plus the number of states. So the dimension of O is equal to the dimension of the polynomial plus the number of legs. So this is a dimension four, this polynomial is a dimension four operator. At dimension five, what can we write? Well, actually, we cannot write down anything for two things because if we want to have the correct weight, we need to add a lambda and a lambda tilde. Oh, no, sorry, that brings us to dimension five. That's very good. So let's start from this and add lambda, lambda tilde. Let's put index one here, for example. We have to contract this into a singlet. Can we? Uh, we should be able to. No, we can't because the lambda tilde cannot contract against anything. Okay, so sorry, that was a kind of trivial example. There's no, there cannot be any spin zero operator of dimension five. We need, uh, need to add two derivatives, so okay, that's trivial. And dimension six, we have lambda one, lambda one, lambda two, lambda two, and then let's add, for example, this square. We have to contract the indices in some way now. And, well, actually, the dotted index here will have to contract against itself. That doesn't exist. So we have to put the other guy, under two, under the tilde. And then, if we contract the indices, there's only one way to contract the indices, and it gives us one, two, cube, one, two. That's the only form factor we have, which we recognize as, because one, two times one, two, angle times square, that's P1 plus P2 square times one, two. So this operator is recognized as del square of trace f alpha beta, f alpha beta. So the only dimension six operators which decay to two particles are total derivatives. So if we're interested in writing down Lagrangian, we don't need to bother about them. But we can also look at operators which can decay to three particles. Let's look at uh, minus, minus, plus, for example. Then we need tilde is like that, two, two, three, three. We need to contract the indices in some way. If we want dimension six, we cannot add anything because the dimension is already six. This polynomial is dimension three and this three legs. So that's a dimension six operator already. And we cannot contract this into a singlet because there's no tilde to contract this guy. It doesn't exist. We can look at this minus, minus, minus. And that now we get our lambdas. Now we can make a contraction. That's the spin zero, dimension six. So here's one, one of these guys. And that guy, we could recognize, if we wanted to, as F alpha beta, F beta gamma, F 
gamma alpha. It's anti-symmetric. And if, if you want it to be gauge invariant, it will thus be proportional to F A. So that's, so that's the only dimension six operator, which is not a total derivative. So this is just an example for how you can use these rules to list physical operators in the theory. So it's, a, it's just a labeling system that I wanted to introduce you to. And it's a very convenient, uh, it's a very powerful system. It's, a, for example, uh, people are interested in the standard model in listing all dimension six operators because they classify possible uh, small deviation from the standard models in uh, precision measurements. And there's actually a lot of dimension six operator in the standard model. There's a lot because there are many fields. And if you have to, you have to mod out by equation the motion, this is very, it becomes a very non-trivial game. But yeah, this problem has been solved anyway by brute force, but probably would be interesting to apply this method to, to revisit this. But yeah, so that's the first ingredient. So we know if we want to act, the S matrix is a matrix, and these polynomials give us very natural states on which to act. So we're gonna take this S matrix and act on these polynomials. So now, why would we expect this to have anything to do with renormalization? So the second ingredient is unitarity. It's a very simple idea. If we look at this form factor at one loop, I'll be first sloppy and then less sloppy. If you look at this form factor at one loop, for O to decay into something, by dimensional analysis, this should scale like P to the dimension of the operator. And the dimension is the canonical dimension plus the anomalous dimension. Okay? One actually has to be more careful. There are infrared divergences also. So that's the total scaling with respect to P. I will describe this gamma for, uh, later. But in general, that's the behavior. If we expand this in perturbation theory, these things are or order G squared. They're small at weak coupling. If we expand this, well, this looks like F0 times a log, log of p square, let me put some pace, and then times gamma plus gamma over two. And it's very important that this log, as usual, you have to take the correct branch of this log. And we're looking at a physical operator which decays to unshell states. So the total center of mass energy is time-like. So this log has an imaginary part. So a quick way to compute the coefficient of the log is to take the imaginary part of this thing. So the imaginary part of the form factor. Yeah, let me rewrite the equation the other way. So gamma plus gamma infrared times three level form factor is equal to minus two over pi times the imaginary part of the one loop form factor. And this is just, you can generalize the statement to higher loop, but the one loop statement takes this form. You see, if you take the imaginary part, because this log is log p square minus i pi. So if you take the imaginary part, it's equivalent to computing the coefficient of the log. One can be a bit more rigorous about that. The uh, uh, because the amplitude has other contributions, I claim that all the contributions are real. Because all the other finite parts are real. And the simple way to, to see that is to use the RG equation, which essentially where this follows. Is that, because we have many momenta, but we, are, or we have the statement that if we rescale all the momenta on F, we get, well, uh, gamma plus gamma IR 
times f. So there's a general RG equation which we can use. And using this equation, if we look in the, uh, you have many, many momenta, but the imaginary part, the, time, the amplitude is defined, remember that amplitudes have branch cut on the real axis. And the amplitude is evaluated here, and the imaginary part is the amplitude at, well, sorry, uh, let's call this point x and y. But you can go from this point to this point by exponentiating the RG equation. If you take, so the imaginary part of the amplitude is equal to 1 minus e to the minus 2 pi i p dot d over d p. If you do do that, that's a way of computing the amplitude. And now you can use the RG equation to relate that to the anomalous dimension. So it's completely general that the imaginary part of the amplitude is related to the anomalous dimension. Tiny loop orders. The duration is just slightly more complicated than that in general. So, so let, let's, so let's continue with that equation. So the anomalous dimension is related to an imaginary part. Now we have to actually use unitarity to evaluate this imaginary part. And re recall the unitarity relation I gave yesterday, that the imaginary part, well, two times the imaginary part of the T matrix is T dagger T. For the form factors, there's something similar. If we look at this form factor at one loop, you would have a graph like that, and the Kutkowski rules tell us that the imaginary part is obtained by cutting it. So the form factor, well, two times the imaginary part of the form factor, is equal to the T matrix acting on the form factor. Okay. Yeah, I'm actually, I wasn't able to, uh, well, I don't properly derive the, 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 where the dagger goes here. <laughs> Perhaps someone can help me after the talk. So, just to be conservative, let's average. <laughs> the question mark. It will not matter for the one loop check because T is real at one loop. <laughs> it will not matter for this talk, but <laughs> this lecture. But yeah, if someone can derive the correct equation, please tell me. <laughs> it will not be uh, needed for, for here. But that, this is the main relation. So let's just call this TF. So we have the anomalous uh, dimension is equal to minus 1 over pi times tf. And this t matrix is now is really, we think of it as a matrix. Is the, uh, at three level, this would be just, at leading order, sorry, this would be the 2 to 2 scattering amplitude. So, so here is a situation where we really have to think of the amplitude as a matrix. And when it's going to act on polynomials, its eigenvalue when it acts on polynomials will give us this quantity, which is not exactly the, which is not quite the anomalous dimension because of this infrared stuff. But this IR here doesn't depend on the operator, so we'll find a way to subtract it. Yeah, and this occurs basically. So this this anomalous dimension comes from UV divergences, and this comes from. IR divergences. So we still have to disentangle these two kind of divergences. And this, the scaling with respect to P doesn't tell us that this difference. Uh, yes? Yes, so that's why I put a little one here. Yes, yes, yes. You can generalize this, but uh, it's not really been tested, and here I will just discuss this case. It's really an open problem to, to really concretely do it at higher loop orders. So just to stay concrete, I've discussed one loop there. So, yeah, so we have this equation. Let me box it. So this is the basic equation which we use. Can I raise this arrow? And I can move there. Done. 
So let's look at examples. I was planning to jump directly to QCD, but maybe a simple example in 5.4 would be useful. <laughs> so in 5.4, The matrix element, well, uh, T222, if I ignore the delta function and unshell stuff, the, the, well, let's just call it the, the 222 amplitude is minus lambda. If I have the Lagrangian, uh, uh, yeah, let's, say that the, the, let's say that if you put 1 over 4 factorial in the action, 5 over 4 factorial, then the amplitude is just that. This what is this? Let's act on the simplest operator, which has coefficient one, which has a form factor one. So let's look at phi square. The form factor for I, phi square to decay to two articles is just one. Very simple operator. And in that case, the formula here, to be useful to put one more equality, this T matrix for 2 to 2 scattering is integral over angle. So it's defined as, well, T2 to 2, 2 F is by definition integral over Lorentz and Varen phase space of P1 prime, P2 prime times the form factor to decay into P1 prime and P2 prime. And P1 prime plus P2 prime is equal to P1 plus P2. As in this diagram. P1, P2, P1 prime, P2 prime. This d -lips can just go to a center of mass frame and write it as 1 over 8 pi integral over angle. And then here we need, sorry, here this is 2 to 2 amplitude there. Then there's a 2 to 2 amplitude but for 1, 2 goes to 1 prime, 2 prime, times f of p1 prime, p2 prime. So that's the basic formula we would use. If we combine the factors, we get this. That's a third, more explicit version of this relation. So we have to integrate over the four-point amplitude over angles. So for the, in this special case of 5 fourth, this is a constant. This form factor is a constant. So this integral just gives 1. And we get that the anomalous dimension is minus 1 over i pi square times minus lambda. So you get the endless dimension of phi square is plus lambda or a phi square. Okay. And you can, you can cross check this against computing the UV divergence of this graph. And unless I made a mistake because I didn't prepare that specific example, it should work. Yeah, and which is actually, yeah, that's a good point. There are no, there's never any IR divergence in 5.4 anyway. There are collinear divergences, which do occur in this gamma IR, but they first appear at two loops through this. So at two loop, one will have to worry about this in 5.4. Not yet. Yeah, so this IR contains collinear stuff also. But in QCD, we won't be so lucky, and this gamma IR will be important. So, okay, I can move here. So now I need some room. <laughs> There's never anything which is completely easy in, in, in QCD, so I will need some room. <laughs> but uh, the, the starting point would be simple. So what, what do we need in QCD? I've already described, or at least let's just do pre angles. In pre, I already described to you what the polynomials are in pre angles. Now let's discuss this guy, which was the content of our first lecture. 
And so the amplitude, the formula we'll use, is now, now I actually have to be careful about signs and factors of two. And I, there are simple ways to check this. I will not uh, uh, go, in, uh, go into that. So there's this thing that we add. And then if we keep our color indices and everything, there's a F, A, B, sorry. Yeah, a, B, if the colors are A, B, C, D, we have F, this guy, F, C, D, F, B, D, and downstairs, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, one, plus, this is the formula we derive in the first uh, lecture, but with this, yeah, in this delta, this delta function and this notation introduced yesterday. Yeah, it was one, just one, two to the fourth in the first lecture. And, okay, this amplitude is fully permutation, permutation invariant, which is, did I get it right? Sorry, AD. Very sorry. Yeah. This amplitude can be checked to be permutation invariant, which is not so uh, obvious maybe, but let, let's just call this thing, if we call this thing, this factor, one over one, two, three, four, an exercise check uh, both symmetry. Check that this is permutation invariant. And the identity which guarantees this is So this term involves this, this second term involves this, and if you do a permutation, you'd think you'd get a different term, but it turns out there's an identity. And if you use this identity, you can check that this is permutation and symmetric. And that's called uh, U1 decoupling. I will not, not explain why. It has a, that, that has a good reason for existing. So, so that's the formula for the tree amplitude. Uh, the second thing we need is a useful way to do this angular integral in terms of spinners. Because you see this formula and, and the, the form factors are all expressed in terms of lambdas and lambda tildes. We have to express the, the angular integral in terms of these measures. And the way to do that, re just remember, when you have a, a spinner, if you make a rotation of it, if you start from spinner one zero, you make a rotation, you get something like cos tail over two, you can just get the motion of spinners parameterized in this way. I need some phase for some, and theta A is the angle with respect to the Z axis, and <coughs> phi is the azimuthal angle. We can parameterize a spinner like that. And here, we have two particles, P1 and P2. So they're labeled by, so, so natural, naturally we want to work in a frame in which they're opposite. And we can do all that covariantly just by rating that lambda one prime is equal to lambda one cos theta over two plus lambda two sine theta over two e. Sorry, purely. Otherwise, I would confuse. And lambda two prime is equal to lambda two cos theta over two minus lambda one sine theta over two. So this this kind of uh, representation is derived in the uh, in the paper by William that I reference, but I just wanted to motivate it. It's very simple to see why you would write that down by thinking about rotations of, of spinners. So the integral then becomes integral d2 omega over four pi. And okay, these one alphs are really annoying. Let me rescale all angles by two. Then it's an integral over zero to pi over two because it's rescaling, d theta, sine two theta, and then integral zero to 
2 pi d phi over 2 pi. So now we can do everything on these spinners. Okay, I don't need to erase, I have plenty of room. The equation will be long, it should fit here. <laughs> don't get scared, it's, very, it's simple building blocks. And hopefully I'm writing big enough that everybody can, can read. So let's look, we'll look at the more, some of the most important operators, which is F square. So that's a, one, of, one of the operators we'll look at. And the, the anomalous dimension of F square is essentially the better function. So that's a very natural guy to look at. And the form factor for F square is, as we discussed, one, two square, where it goes to minus minus is one, two square. But then this will only give us gamma of F square plus gamma IR. So we get some integral. But that's not useful yet until we find some way of computing gamma IR. We could compute this from the infrared divergence by computing the infrared divergence, some cross section, and so on. A shortcut is to use the fact that the stress tensor has zero anomalous dimension. So the other thing we'll calculate is the, is the form, is the, sorry, that's F, form factor the, to go to stress tensor. And the stress tensor can decay to minus plus, and its matrix element, so it's, it's spin two, it's conserved, you can write it as T alpha, yeah, it's, sorry, it's traceless at three level, you can write it in spinner indices like that. It's lambda one, lambda one, lambda two, so we'll look at these two form factors. And by looking at these two, this second one will give us gamma t mu nu plus gamma ir. And because this is zero, the difference of the two equations will give us gamma f squared. Oh, so this is a very good point. It's, uh, uh, there are very simple, there are factorization theorems which are proof. And the IR divergence, it's, it, it's simple. If you look at this form factor here, the IR divergence comes from very far away. They don't care at all about what's happening there. So they depend on the angles at which the particles are going. It depends on what the particles are. They don't depend on the operator. So this gamma IR is the same, and it cancels when we take the difference. That's very important. Yeah. Yeah, the infrared divergence are completely factorized from the UV one. So what integral do we get here? Okay, let's look at the first, let's compute the first one first. So, I can draw it here. So I have the four-point amplitude here, I have this cut, and here I have this, and this cut, and this cut I have minus, minus, plus, plus. So the amplitude here, okay, let me, yeah, the amplitude here will be given by one to the fourth over, let's say this is one, two, one prime, two prime. The amplitude here, okay, and I missed, I forgot the, looking at the gauge environment case, so this delta AB. If I put this delta AB into this, I just get NC times delta AB. Yeah, let me put some space. Then I get this 2G square. And then this parenthesis gives me what, 1, 2 to the fourth, or 1, 2, and then 2, 2 prime. 2 prime, 1 prime, 1 prime, 1. Okay, and then there'll be the other terms. The other terms is simple permutation. So let's just evaluate this using the explicit spinners. Give us some experience. So there's a one, two, two, two prime. So that's mine. Yeah, so that's minus two, one. That's plus one, two sine. Things will simplify momentarily. 
the next guy is two prime one prime. That one is harder to compute, but it's just two one. As you sort of will expect, is this because the center of mass energy here and here is the same, and one two is essentially the center of mass, or square the center of mass energy. So I won't derive, I won't check that one. And the last one, one prime one, one prime one is so proportional to two one. 2, 1 times sine theta. This is a sine, and now there's the opposite phase. The phase cancel. The 1, 2s all cancel. So we just have 1 over sine squared theta. The other guy, the color structure gives the same. And it's related by symmetry, it really just gives this. And that is. 1 over sine square cos square theta. Okay, so we computed that matrix element. So this here, let's collect the terms. This is a minus 1 over i pi, I pi, pi square. This is a 2 g square and c. Then this. Okay, let's ignore the delta AB for a second. There's a symmetry factor of two we have to include because these two particles are indistinguishable. And then there's an integral from zero to pi over two, d theta, sine to theta. Okay, then we have this thing here, sine square cross square. And now we just have to evaluate this operator at the shifted place. And that it's actually just 1, 2 again. So we get 1, 2 square delta AB, which, so we get the left-hand side and right-hand side are proportional to each other. Yeah, so, so, so the this dimension is just that. Is that what I add? Yes. Very good. So that's our first guy. Notice the integral is cooling out divergence. That's not an issue, because we expected, we know that the amplitude has soft and cooling out divergence, so this gamma IR that we're subtracting actually is cooling out divergence. But it will, this cooling out divergence will cancel in a second when we take, when we cancel gamma IR. So the other guy gives basically the same thing. Okay, let's simplify this. This is sine two theta is two sine cos. So that's just two, and now that the squares are gone. Yeah, so that's two d theta over sine theta cos theta. And the bracket, now we have to evaluate again. Okay, let me draw the, now the angular integral is not trivial. What's the angular integral? We have to evaluate, now the amplitude is a different one. We have two cases. One case as, we're still looking at one plus here. We can have one plus on the inside, or we can have plus minus on the inside. Let's do, ah, sorry, let me, let's do this case first. It's simpler. This case, the plus minus case, give us, in the plus minus case, the numerator is one, two prime. It's one, two, two prime. The numerator is one, two prime to the fourth, which differs from the one, two to the fourth that we've included previously. That's the numerator from the amplitude. And then there's the form factor, which is this. So we have to put, evaluate it at lambda prime. And lambda prime is essentially lambda 1 cos plus lambda 1 sine EI phi. Sorry, lambda 2. 
with this guy square, and then it's lambda tilde two minus lambda tilde one sine yi phi. Lambda tilde is the complex conjugate, so the phase is, is the opposite of that one here. You see that when we do the angular integral, that's very, something very simple happens, is that all these terms just get killed. The angular integral just give us, uh, there's a cut here, sorry, just give us lambda one square, lambda two square, which is what we had originally. So if we divide by this, we get one, but we get cos to the fourth. And this thing, so this whole thing here, just give cos four theta. This thing, which is one, two prime, one, two prime, so that's one, two times cos. So this thing is also cos the four. So the whole thing is just cos four, uh, cos to the eight theta. And the other guy related by symmetry is just sine square, uh, sorry, sine eight theta. So we're done. If we take the difference, <coughs> We have that gamma phi square. Let's collect factors. These two cancel. There's a two here. So that gives minus alpha strong over pi. That's yeah, g square over four pi square. Times integral zero pi over two d theta, or sine theta, cos theta, one minus sine eight minus cos eight. Now the divergences have canceled. That's just a number. You can compute this number. That's minus alpha strong over two pi. I'm oh, sorry, there's an nc, so it's in front, times 11 third. So this, what, uh, what have we learned? This thing here knows about the QCD better function. But that was expected in general ground. So what is the lesson in general? So I, I've checked this on a couple of examples. I don't have time to I have some yet unpublished notes on this. Hopefully this would be uh, uh, out. But I think this is a very simple idea. And what's the simple idea here? which is the one used by, by Willem, is that S matrix acting on polynomial is equal to the dilatation operator. And that, well, the strict equality here is at one loop, but I think it is clear that in the future this will be generalized to higher loops Gang Yang has been working on this, among others. I'm sure there's a long, there's a long, long and, and nice story awaiting here. Another thing is we obtain formulas for, you can, once we have computed this gamma IR, which we've done here, because yeah, this is, this is zero. So we've just computed gamma IR in terms of this cos eight plus sine eight. Now we can subtract it to any operator we want. So now this gives the, that's the full, that's the full one loop dilatation operator in, in QCD. That is given here. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, So I think it's a very, very, very beautiful idea that uh, uh, that was discovered last fall, and yeah, it worked. It has nothing to do with n equals to four. It has nothing to do with with symmetry or integrability. It's just unitarity, and the two, two, two amplitude gives the uh, gives the renormalization. 
have five minutes left, I think. Uh, this is enough to discuss the N equals K, N equals 4 case briefly. So in N equals 4, historically, what people looked at are the simplest operator in N equals 4 are involved scalars. And people historically, following uh, Minahan and Zarembo in 2001, look at chain of operators involving two scalar fields, where Z would be uh, phi 1, 2, and X would be phi 1, 3. These are two SU4 indices. But look at trace of operators like that. And what Minan and Zahambo found is that the dilatation operator acting on this kind of chain can be mapped to an integrable spin chain. And it's interesting to see this here. So we've just, I've just said that the dilatation operator at one loop is the S matrix. So let's just hit this guy with the S matrix. So we need four things. So we need the S matrix for, we need the M suit for ZZ goes to ZZ. So let's draw a diagram here. Z, Z, X, and so on. And the planar limit at one loop, we just get pairwise interaction between nearest neighbor. And we have to integrate over these cuts. And this amplitude here can have, will involve just scalars, but sparse, sparse scalars. Because of, con yeah, ZZ can only go to ZZ by symmetry. This ZZ goes to ZZ amplitude can be computed from this factor. I just record the answer up to a constant minus s over t. A, then the next case is zx goes to zx, which turns out to be equal to plus u over t. And the next thing is a zx goes to xz, which turns out to be equal to plus 1. Very good. So these are the basic S matrices. And now the dilatation operator. Now there's a nice thing. We don't have to look at the stress tensor in this theory because we know that gamma ZZ equals zero. It's a protected Carroll operator. Well, let's just call it it's a BPS operator. The standard dimension is zero. And we have this other equation which shows that gamma ZZ plus gamma IR is equal to integral of integral d to omega of a z z goes to z z. So essentially, this amplitude gives us gamma i r. That's zero. So now we can subtract it from the other one so that the gamma, the matrix element for gamma z x goes to z x. Or in general, gamma would be equal to integral a two to two minus az, zz goes to zz times the identity. So that, that's what we get here. So if we compute this here, the matrix element for z, zx goes to zx involves the integral of u over t minus, minus s over t. And because s plus t plus u equals 0, that's minus 1. Integral of minus 1 minus 1. And gamma for zx goes to xz is equal to plus 1, because the identity doesn't contribute to this. So that gives us the action of dilatation. The so how does this class of operator renormalize? What happens that this is the amplitude for the operator to go to itself when this is zx. The amplitude for it when the zx Exchange. So we can write that the Hamiltonian, well, the, the gamma 1 on this chain of operator, write the chain, yeah. Gamma 1 is a sum over adjacent pairs of the amplitude for them to exchange. minus the amplitude 
for two particles to go straight, which is the uh, famous Hamiltonian that was, this, that was discussed by, uh, by Hans Betty in 31 or in the, 30, in, in the very early on. <laughs> it was diagonalized explicitly, so it's a, it's a integrable Hamiltonian. So yeah, just to finish the lecture, I will rewrite this object again. So this is delta eight on the eta over one, two, two, three, three, four, four, one. So it's a very simple object, but it knows about many important things. It knows about the QCD beta function. We just did periangles, but this has fermions in it also, and you can get the NF terms also if you want. And it knows about, well, Eisenberg spin chain. Yeah, so that's the, uh, the spin chain. And it generalizes it to a, uh, 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 yeah. So, yeah. and there's a starting point for this N course four theory being, being integrable. But yeah, this is, uh, yeah, I think I've said enough. Thank you.